right, so we should get started. It's exactly 3.30 and as always, uh, we are starting on time and to be respectful to everyone else who is participating, we are also going to end on time. So this will last exactly 30 minutes and not a minute over. If for some reason in the meantime you have questions and we didn't get to your question, uh, please make sure you leave it there. We are going to send you a copy of the recording and we are going to address your question nevertheless. Uh, even if we have to email you the answer back afterwards. So welcome everyone. I am immigration attorney Connie Kaplan and I am here with Melissa Ramnot, who is a tra trademark attorney in our area. Melissa and I work very closely together on our business um, and investor cases because it looks like there is a lot that intertwines. So before we get started in terms of housekeeping, exactly 30 minutes, put your questions in chat. Don't be shy. Go for it. And either I will address it or Melissa will address it or you'll get an email from us nevertheless. So let's start and tell you who we are. So let's go with Melissa first. OK, so Melissa, attorney Melissa Ramnot, she is an experienced trial winning trademark and business attorney. She represented large businesses in commercial litigation cases and now represents new and growing businesses regarding federal trademark contracts. And more than that, she has extensive litigation knowledge and her trademarks are just top notch. OK, if you have the right trademark, you are avoiding the risk of future lawsuits. Uh, she's got her law degree and her bachelor's degree from University of Miami. I'm not her friend because of that, okay? But anyway, that's where she got it. And she is admitted to practice law in the state of Florida and the Southern District. As to myself, your host for today, um, I am an immigration attorney and that is all I do. I dedicate my private practice exclusively to immigration law. I am an immigrant myself. I had to navigate the same issues at... Uh, my clients, my bachelor's degrees in business. So I understand the business aspects of uh, our entrepreneurs and our investors. And my law degree is from uh, Nova Southeastern University. I have been an adjunct professor of law at Nova Southeastern University as well. And I'm a member of AILA, uh, which is the American Immigration Lawyer Association. And if you don't know what it is, that's where we get all the goodies and all the news and all the information that we can use to win our applications for our clients. So to continue, I wanted first to introduce Melissa, introduce myself so you know who you're listening to. And Melissa created a short presentation for us. So we are going to get started on that first. So you have a little bit of basics and we'll take it from there. OK, so Melissa, why don't you get started on that? Yes, thank you so much, Connie. I'm so happy to be here. So business law can be a confusing subject, but if we break it down into categories, it can be easier to understand. The four main areas are trademarks, entity formation, contracts, and copyrights. I'm going to go through entity formation, contracts, and copyrights very briefly, and then focus on trademarks because that's the most important in my opinion. And so I help business owners legally protect their business. And when you legally protect your business, you can save your business a lot of time and money, which is important to growing your business. And in addition to having 10 years legal experience from working with companies all the way from startup contracts to litigation to restructuring and bankruptcy at the end, I also have practical experience because I opened my own law firm. So I know firsthand the importance of business law. And just a little bit of background, I opened my own law firm so I could have a flexible schedule and spend more time with my family. And so we will get started with trademarks. And so trademarks are the most important aspect of a business. A trademark is a brand identifier. It is a name a logo, a slogan, um, anything that identifies your business as a source identifier. And a trademark, it is important because of the process. So the trademark process is two steps. So step one is a trademark clearance search. And step two is the trademark application. The trademark clearance search, which is step one, 
is your due diligence. You want to make sure that you reduce the risk of getting sued. You always need to start with the trademark clearance search. Having a domain name or an LLC is not enough. And that's because the threshold is likelihood of confusion. Your mark cannot be too similar to another trademark. So if you add an S to another trademark, or if you take another logo and you flip it upside down, you can still be sued for trademark infringement. And so a trademark clearance search can help save you time and money because if you lose an infringement suit, you would have to rebrand. That means a new website, new products, new ads, and you could also have to potentially pay those profits that you made related to the trademark back to the other party, and you don't want that. You could also lose clients and customers, and an example of this is the Clubhouse app lawsuit. Clubhouse is a popular app that grew in popularity over the pandemic, and they were even valued at $4 billion. And then they were sued for trademark infringement because they did not conduct a trademark clearance search. If they did, they would have seen that that name was already taken by someone in a similar industry. And so they were sued and they lost a tremendous amount of valuation almost immediately. They settled confidentially. We don't know whether they spent millions or billions to make that go away. So learn from them, do your due diligence, do things the right way. Step two is the trademark application process. It is the application that you file with the USPTO. It is short, but it's intricate. So a $350 filing fee can cost you 10 times that amount if you make a mistake and have to hire an attorney to fix that mistake. So be efficient, save your company money, file it right the first way with an attorney. The trademark timeline is pretty simple. You file your application with the USPTO, and then you don't hear anything back from the office for about four to six months. After that, a trademark examining attorney is assigned. They would either issue an initial refusal in the form of an office action, or put your application through to the publication phase. Altogether, if everything goes smoothly, you can expect a registration in about 18 months. It has been slower since COVID. I know I experienced that myself, so it's been forever. Yes. And trademark uh, costs are usually flat fees. Almost every firm charges a flat fee. That means that you pay a sum up front and you won't have to pay additional money if additional work is needed. And it's more affordable than patents, which can cost $20,000 or more, or being sued for infringement. Because if you have to rebrand, you could spend $100,000 and pay attorney's fees and damages to the other party. And our flat fee includes a comprehensive trademark search. So what that means is I look at all federal registrations, pending applications, state business listings. I also search online, common law sources, I try to look for everything that could be potentially similar to your mark. It's usually hundreds of pages that I find, but I summarize everything for you in two to three pages. So you know what I found, what it means, and what's important. After that, I help you uh, gather everything to file the trademark application. I file it for you, and I serve as your attorney for approximately 18 months. And if you reach out to me after this presentation, our firm will offer you a special discount on our trademark package. Oh, we must take advantage of that. All right. I hope so. <laughs> and now to business formations. Business formations mean business entity structures. And the purpose of a business entity is to limit the liability for business debts and lawsuits. So for example, if a creditor sues your business, you want to make sure that you have limited liability through the form of a business entity. So that way, if they get a judgment, they can only recover from business assets and business accounts. You don't want them to come after your personal bank accounts or your personal home. And these are the four main business entities, sole proprietorship, corporation, partnership, and limited liability. You'll get a copy of this um, after the presentation, but basically a limited liability company is the best entity for a new and growing company because it offers strong liability protection 
with minimal formalities. And you can always change later on if you want to start issuing chair, shares, you can transfer your entity into a corporation once your company is ready to handle those complex tax and legal requirements. And so in order to protect your limited liability, you have to maintain certain requirements, such as filing your annual registration, keeping business contracts and assets and liabilities in the business name, following your operating agreement if there is one, and not commingling personal and business funds. So if you have a business credit card, use it only for business matters. If you have a personal credit card, use it for only personal matters. If you don't do this, the court can find that your limited liability status is void and a creditor might be able to recover from your personal business accounts and you do not want that. Okay. Oh, we have one more section. Okay. Yes. Um, Briefly, contracts are very important because they set the expectations and agreements between the parties. You want to make sure there is minimal misunderstandings. A contract is also important because it lays out that any liability will be a liability of the business and not the owner personally. And when you have contracts, you don't need to reinvent the wheel every time. You can have an attorney create a template for you that you could use in the future for similar dealings. And these are some of the most uh, common contracts that I've seen. Independent contractor agreement. This can be used if you're hiring a third party to complete a service for you and they are not your employee. A copyright assignment agreement is, for example, if you hire a graphic designer to create a logo for you, you want them to sign this because you want them to transfer those copyright rights to you because whoever creates something owns it. And when that graphic designer creates it, they own it until you get them to assign their rights to you. And you as a growing company want to own all of your intellectual property. The operating agreement is a contract between the owners that states how the company will be run. And lastly, the client services agreement is a contract for your business's own clients and customers. It sets the terms for payment, refunds, um, miscellaneous things like cancellations, and licensing. So if, thank you for all this information. We had, there you go with copyrights, but before we get to copyrights, we had some questions that came from the people who registered to the webinar ahead of time. So before we get to copyrights, I'll ask some trademark questions, all right? So how can trademarks save money for a business owner? So I, uh, I guess the clubhouse is the most recent example that I've seen. Um, so if you, when you do your trademark clearance search, you're minimizing the risk of being sued for train, trademark infringement. So if you start off one day and maybe you're living under a rock, you didn't know Starbucks was already taken, you come up with the name Starbucks and you get sued, you could have to you know, buy a new domain name. You have to print all new labels for your products. You have to file a new trademark application for that because you didn't take the time to do the first step, which is a trademark clearance search. And so that's how you can save money. Okay. And the trademarks clearance search is not a Google search, right? Let's be clear. Right. It's not a Google search. It's more than a Google search because you have to understand what the examiner will be looking for. They're going to look for anything that's too similar. So you can put in your Google search, but it may only pull up something that's exactly the same. You also have to search for things that are too similar to what you're looking for. And searching the state business listings for all 50 states could take you a year to do what it could take an attorney a week to do. So you might be able to do it, but then again, you're wasting your own time and money where you can get it quicker and faster from an experienced attorney. And we have been through this process with some of our brands or for some of our clients and everybody thinks I'm just going to Google and if there is no other business that comes up with my name, I'm good to go. And there are multiple levels. It could be a DBA. It depends on the state. It depends on the country. It depends on the location. It depends on the type of business and the industry. And it's not just as simple as just the domain name or just the logo. So people forget that important part and then they start the business next thing you know they can't even get anybody to their website because it conflicts on the dns settings right which is and, the internet 
Yes, and if you just do a Google search, you may miss a company that intends to use the name in the future because the trademark office lets you file applications for when what you intend to use as a trademark. And so if you don't check that, you could be missing out on a company who has priority because they file their application first. Yes, exactly. What is the difference between what trademarks protect and what copyrights protect? So copyrights protect creative works and trademarks create protect brands. Sometimes they overlap as with the case of logos, but if you have a company name, um, so for example, if we called our company Melissa Connie, we could trademark that as our brand if it wasn't already taken, but we wouldn't be able to copyright it because the copyright office might not think that that's creative enough. There has to be something more than mere fact. It has to be a creative entity uh, aspect. Okay, and the reason this is important for our immigrant entrepreneurs who are looking to get investor visas into the United States, the cost that is associated with getting the copyrights for the content, getting the trademarks for the logos, the brand, the domain, and all that, those are considered as part of the investment. And the legal fees associated with it are considered part of the investment. The costs, the creative costs associated with creating the logo, with, cre with doing all this, it's part of the investment. And in some cases where we have entrepreneurs who are in the tech arena, if they are creating an app or they are creating um, a software or a platform or a program that runs a certain way, uh, there is also the, it, they can get protection through a patent. It depends on the proprietary system, proprietary, whatever it is, if it improved in the previous trust, all those costs, no matter how large or limited they may be, they are considered part of the investment. And for example, in the case of a regular business who just wants to open, for example, a trucking company, they really only care about the name and the logo uh, and maybe the domain. But when you're looking at creating an app, they really the value of the company is in the intellectual property. And it is really in the patent and the trademark and the copyrights. And that is really the value of the company. It really is the value in the patent and how sellable that is, right? Exactly. You want to make sure that you protect this on the front end so that way you can reduce the risk of having to sue to enforce it later on. And once you have these registrations for copyright patents and trademarks, it makes enforcing it a lot easier and cost efficient than if you did not have it. And can you file a trademark application even before you start the business? Yes, these are called intent to use applications. So if you want to, you come up with a great company name, but you didn't launch the business yet, but you're going to launch it within about a year and a half, you can file a trademark application and it's called intent to use application. And that will give you priorities, kind of like your placeholder in line. So if somebody comes along and starts the business and file it after you, you still have priority because you put that application in in the first place. And how long does a trademark last? I mean, I know you get priority, so that's on the front end, but how about at the end? So a trademark, it lasts as long as you keep using the mark. So you can get trademark protection forever. You just have to make sure to keep up with your certain annual filings uh, between the fifth and six years is the first time you have to file a renewal. After that, you have to file a renewal between the ninth and tenth year. And then after that, it's every 10 years. Unlike copyrights, which is generally the life of the author plus 70 years or 120 years from creation, trademarks can be forever. Okay, so if you write a book that is copyright, that is life of the author versus something yeah. like a trademark. Got it. Okay, see, even I'm learning something and I'm learning every day. So thank you for that, Melissa. So a couple of other questions that uh, came in. Do they really need a lawyer to trademark? Um, a lot of people, they may not want to have a lawyer, but it is really, it can be the most cost efficient way. You don't have to have a lawyer to represent you in a criminal trial, but do you want to take that risk? Do you want to take the risk of having to file 10 tra trademark applications before you finally get it right instead of hiring a lawyer for a fraction of that price to do it right the first time and to let you know what else you need to protect? They can give you an umbrella overview instead of a narrow focus that you may have if you're not in the industry. 
it's very interesting you mentioned that because in immigration we get that a lot oh i'm just going to fill out some forms and it's never ever about filling out just some immigration forms ever nothing about immigration is the forms if there is one word on that application that you do not understand then that's it you should stop um you, there is an advantage to hiring a lawyer for these types of processes that may seem very intuitive and very easy in the beginning or to the average business person, mm -hmm. but it is never like that. I mean, most of our business, bulk of our business is really people who have tried to do it on their own the first time, the second time, and they failed. And the cost of even trying to fix that if there is a fix, because in some cases with immigration is once you're done, uh, in some cases they run out of status. There are so many other issues that we need to overcome and the cost is not even an issue anymore. They have to pay so much more and they lost time. They lost money. The delays and the mistakes that are uh, happening are just cumulative at that point. Right. Um, it, it's a... Uh not something that everyone understands, but we try to put these videos out there as much as possible so that way people know that when you do it most efficiently, you are saving money in the end, even though it looks like you're spending money to do it. And so, as for, go ahead. I was going to say a question that I get oftentimes because I do a lot of business with the Caribbean community and immigrants is what options are available to people to use businesses as a means to immigrate to the country? Great question. And generally speaking, okay, they can come as employees, but those would be employment based and it's not what we are talking about. We are talking about investing into their own business and coming to the United States and opening their own business with an investor visa to start and work in the United States. And they generally have three options, okay? Uh, one is E1 or E2, so that is, E1 for treaty uh, investor, treaty traders, uh, which have trade with the US government. And second is treaty investors, E2. Then we have um, L1 in case they have already a business outside in the United States and they want to open a subsidiary or an affiliate in the United States. And of course we have EB5 and that has two different options where the dollar amount for the investment is significantly higher and they need to either invest, generally buying shares, so to speak, into a regional center such as a hospital or a mall or where their, their investment is being pooled and as a result they are creating jobs and they can get permanent residency. Some of these options do lead to permanent residency and some of them not, but they can be renewed for 20 something years. I have a business client that has been our client for over almost 20 years at this point. We inherited them and um, they are on E2. I mean, their children were born here and they are over 21 and they are sponsoring the parents at this point. Of course, the E2 visa requires that we do have a treaty with the other country. The L1 doesn't require that, but you still need to have the business abroad uh, open while you are running the L1 here, the subsidiary or affiliate. Of course, this is very generic and there is a lot more involved. And since you asked that, one of the common questions is, well, how much money do I need to invest? Okay, and that comes up all the time. Well, it makes a difference, okay? What kind of business you are going to open if you are, Developing an app, it's a different investor, it's a different investment amount than it is for, say, a coffee shop, than it would be for a manufacturing plant. Obviously, if you are opening a coffee shop, the investment is going to be significantly less than a manufacturing plant with 300 employees and I don't know how many machines. It also matters where you come from because the dollar exchange and the dollar amount, okay, is different. You cannot require uh, $200,000, $300,000 investment for someone who's coming from a third world country, even though we have a treaty versus someone who's coming, for example, from Switzerland, right? Because the value of the dollar is different. So there is no dollar amount that is specifically written in the statute that is required. It is always based on market research by the location where the business gets open 
country of origin, where you are applying, you are applying in the United States or abroad, type of business, number of employees, and so on. So since we have five more minutes left, I have two questions I see in the chat. First one is from Esteban, who says, do I have to trademark my business if I wish to take it to the US? Um, you can e trademark your business in the US first, and then you can apply to have that trademark in the other country. So the US is part of a treaty with about 100 other countries. So oftentimes people use a US trademark as a jumping board or a spring to get trademark registration in another country. OK, great. See, I didn't know that. I learned that, too, uh, which is why we talk all the time. And then I have a question from Juan, but I guess that question is for me. It says, can I apply for a green card if I own a business in the United States? I am from Nicaragua. Well, first, if you want a green card implies permanent residency. So we are already not looking at E1, E2. We are limited to two options. L1, assuming you have a business abroad that has a subsidiary or an affiliate in the US, and I don't know what your business structure is in the US, or if you invested over $1 million, it's really, it's a dollar amount, 1.050000, okay, uh, in your own uh, business in the United States and have at least 10 employees, and all those funds came from abroad, or you reinvested money from your business in the United States in the business until you reach that dollar amount, then yes, you can apply for a permanent uh, residency in the United States or a green card. Sometimes, depending on your family situation, your education, your experience, your background, the revenues of the business, number of employees and so on, you might have other options. So it's always good to book a uh, consultation with an experienced immigration attorney and discuss all those details. Uh, more often than not, we actually find options through the spouse or find the roundabout ways to get a green card that doesn't even involve the business. So you never know. All right. So we have three minutes to go. Uh, two other questions that they had was, can I bring my family if I come to the United States as an investor? And in most cases, yes, you can. Uh, your family can come. Your spouse also gets, for most of these visas, they, your spouse also gets a work permit and a social security number. So they are available, they are able to work for another employer or they can work in your business. You, however, are limited to the business. And the children can also come and they are eligible in general until the age of 21. And can business owners become U.S. citizens? And yes, they can, as long as they first become permanent residents or get their green card like one was asking. OK, um, there was one other question that we had for you, Melissa, and I know we're jumping back and forth, but I'm really trying to squeeze in as much as we can in this 30 minutes and answer all the questions. And there was one more question. Um, do you need to file a separate application for logo and the business name? Yes. That came before. OK. The trademark office requires you file a separate application for the logo and a separate application for the business name. But if you have different categories, say you have a restaurant, you also have a bookstore or an online blog, you could file those categories within the one application for the logo and the one application for the name, but it's separate applications for the name and logo. Great. So, Melissa, thank you so much for giving us all this information. I did learn a couple of things. If somebody wants to reach you, how do they reach you? They go to trademarknearme.com, which redirects to mdgrlaw.com, which is my initials, Melissa Diane Gulseran Ramon. So, trademarknearme.com? Yes, trademarknearme.com. See, I should have done that to myself, immigration near me. Well, I didn't. So in my case, it's ConnieKaplanLawyer.com. So it's my full name, Lawyer.com or 954-357-0957. Thank you, Melissa, so much for being here with us. And thank you all three of you, four of you, five of you who attended. I can't see the number of participants anymore. We have more people registered. You are going to get a copy of this recording. And by all means, if we can address any of your questions, please feel free to reach back to us and ask us those questions. And we'll be more than happy to address them or book a consultation with us. It's money well spent. Pleasure seeing you all. Um, and good to see you, Melissa. We'll chat soon. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah.